I'll be talking uh, about the fact that I no longer have a job from Friday. <laughs> I know. It's all rather scary. First time I won't have had a proper job since I was 12, I think, when I started turkey plucking. <laughs> that is actually true. And Even... it's a big country. <laughs> <laughs> I lost my job a few weeks ago, and that wasn't a proper job either. Good evening. Welcome to Have I Got News For You. I'm John Prescott. In the news this week, ten years after being caught fair dodging, it looks like Sherry Blair's at it again. <laughs> <laughs> In Westminster, as the new MPs arrive, there's a worrying moment when a Commons official asks if anybody wants an expense claim form. <laughs> And on the eve of the carnival, one Notting Hill resident announced what he'll be serving from the stall in his front garden. A lean salad of lemon and lime marinated <laughs> roasted tofu with baby spinach and rocket, home roasted plum tomatoes and grilled ficelle crouton <laughs> for just £1.70. <laughs> and his team is a comedian from Liverpool. Is there any other kind of Liverpoolian? Please welcome John Bishop. And on Paul's team, a newsreader and presenter who was once named in the FHM magazine as the 92nd sexiest woman in the world. So, only 91 places behind Pauline. That mm. should get me back in the good books. <laughs> Please welcome Penny Smith. <laughs> and we start with the biggest stories of the week. Paul and Penny, take a look at this. All oh, right, this is the oil leak, isn't it? That's still, there's the Black Sea. Uh, this is the <laughs> oil leak in America. There's finding a bit of sand that's not contaminated by oil. Is this there? Uh, yes, so this is the BP continual failure to stem this terrible leak under the sea. With this thing called Top Kill, which sounded quite good, didn't Top it? Top Kill, that's right. They, yeah. they chuck old golf balls and rubber tyres down this hole to stop it. It's sort of top dirty. technology, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> <laughs> top Kill. Did you, and do you remember the boom as well with the, with the human hair on it that was supposed to stop mm. it reaching the beaches on Louisiana? It was just a I could, I could never barking, understand isn't that. it? All they needed to do is get a load of middle-aged men to clear out their belly button. The <laughs> stuff that's in the middle. That would stop anything. Yeah. In oh, fact, really? just around this table, we could have stopped it. Not you, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> never, never, never. Or you could alternately get lots of really hairy men to actually swim through it, soaking it all up. <laughs> and these ideas aren't that much more ludicrous than what BP's no. been doing. <laughs> I think the next one is they're going to put a million tons of chips in and set fire to it. <laughs> well, that's very interesting to me. Yes. <laughs> Since the oil well exploded six weeks ago, BP set up a live video link showing the damaged pipe gushing oil into the ocean. Sounds like a brilliant PR move. Let's have a look at it. You know what that's like? That's like being coarse, having sex with your wife's sister and then videoing it and saying, look, I'm sorry, love, but if you want to see what it looked like, this is it. <laughs> I've dropped a massive bollock, but I filmed it. <laughs> the PR department seems pretty laid back about the situation. One recently appointed public relations man said, and to think BP employed me to get them in the newspaper. <laughs> BP have tried several ways of uh, stemming the flow of oil. What was the method known as top hat? That was putting an enormous bucket on top um, and thinking that all the oil would go into that. And then there was top kill, and then there's the latest operation, which is... Oh, no! It won't stop. <laughs> 
understand how they can have actually laid all these pipes and all the rest of it under the sea and not actually thought at any stage, do you know, just in case there's, I don't know, some massive cephalopod goes in there and nibbles through one of the pipes and then all of a sudden... Do you know what? Well, you never know, do you? Do you think that's what it was? A giant squid? <laughs> <laughs> cephalopod. I love the fact that that's what comes to your... I'm never playing Scrabble with you. You can... <laughs> The steel dome was lowered over the faulty blowout preventer to block it. Anyone know what a blowout preventer is? <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that when the waiter says the, the kitchen is now closed? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've been an MP, you must know where they service those kind of blowout situations. There must be a place in the Commons where you go, look, I'm, I'm going to have a blowout, can you prevent it? <laughs> Only a Liverpoolian could have said that. <laughs> it's some technical equipment, but this is a very complicated area. Yeah. Luckily, the BBC had Dr Simon Botzel from the University of Southampton on hand to demonstrate the top hat method in simple terms. Yeah. This oil spill is happening at one mile depth, and so it's unique to anything else that we've dealt with on this planet before. And so to do that, they are quite literally using a huge cap. <laughs> Their cap is made out of like, steel, our cap is made out of a tin can. <laughs> Why has it got pink stuff tied round it? Is it? What is going on with this, It's dough? a boy. What? It's a boy. <laughs> it's a boy. Congratulations, <laughs> Penny. <laughs> <laughs> what? And there I was, I didn't even know I was pregnant. <laughs> The latest method, according to the BP website, involves using robots to cut off the damaged pipe at the top of the blowout preventer with a diamond wire cutter. This method is known as the Lower Marine Riser Package Cap Container System. <laughs> <laughs> what is it known for short? Flange. In short. <laughs> flange. There's always a flange in engineering, there really is. <laughs> Not just in engineering, <laughs> Manny. <laughs> It's known as cap and slice. In the midst of all this, the BP Chief Operating Officer, Doug Scuttle, stepped in to make a reassuring statement. What did he say? Scuttle what? by name, Scuttle by name. <laughs> he said, this scares everybody. The fact that we can't make this well stop flowing. <laughs> That's what you want at a moment like this. Leadership, don't you? <laughs> and shit yourself as well. <laughs> As if that wasn't reassuring enough, BP have published a list of helpful contact numbers on their website. You can see numbers there for coastline information, wildlife distress, and if you look closely, there's also a number labelled, Do you have any idea? <laughs> of... <laughs> what has this man got to do with all this? It's Henry Waxman, a US energy... It's only really what you give me. <laughs> Is that what you said in Cabinet? <laughs> We've all been waiting for that, haven't we? <laughs> Obviously, lots of people are upset about the oil spill. Here's Senator James Carville talking about Obama. It just looks like he, he's not involved in this, man. You got to get down here and take his hold of this, put somebody in charge of this thing and get this thing moving. We're about to die down here. <laughs> he's what you want, is he? Somebody who looks like he sits on benches and shouts at buses. <laughs> he looks like the kind of, you know, if you walk into a pub and there's a bloke who looks like that at the bar and says, do you fancy a game of darts? You go, no. <laughs> Well, the Americans have had a number of strategies. The first one was blaming the British, which worked for a while, because it's obviously all our fault, British petroleum. And now they're blaming Obama, because he personally hasn't dived down <laughs> after walking on the water um, and saved them. And they're furious with him. This is what happens when you're in power, isn't it, John? You get blamed for everything. I don't know. I was never in power. But I always got blamed for everything. Uh, right. <laughs> This is the... Good, so I was going to say, they're probably also blaming Obama because now that he's in, he's got no control over oil, whereas when Bush was there, yeah. Bush owned all the oil and he could just say to the oil, go back or I'll tell me dad on you. <laughs> I know I'm a bit thick, but why... It, I, you know, they have these divers, deep-sea divers, who go down to the bottom of these rigs and sort everything out. It's a mile deep. 
you would implode. <laughs> They've got that bathosphere. I know there was. I yeah, read about a bathosphere. You can go down in a bathosphere. They do sphere. go down. Maybe down. pop out with a little robotic. With arm. a mop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Such a female way of going. Just clean it up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is the biggest ever American oil disaster. According to the Sun, the oil slick is the size of Luxembourg, and with all the appeal of Belgium. <laughs> One of the failed attempts to solve this crisis was to cover the leaking oil pipe with something described as a top hat. Bloody hell, has David Cameron been advising them? Yes, what? indeed. Bring on the class war. <laughs> <laughs> From Lord Prescott. <laughs> I'm loving this. The only reason I know I've been booked is to put a scouser right between these two. <laughs> To try and get a little bit of balance. No, you've been booked to field the first punch. <laughs> <laughs> Have you got a name yet? Are you are you Lord Prescott of some? They usually make up some word that sounds no, like you Terry Pratchett. It. I only read it in the press. There's been no official communication. Oh, I've misjudged you. So you're not going to become a lord. <laughs> you've stuck to your principles. Well, well done, John. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, in the old British system, you are summoned to that, and so far it has not happened. So you can't call me that, so don't kneel at the moment, perhaps later. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. You say that to all the girls. <laughs> <laughs> Ian and John, here's yours. Oh, going in. And coming out. Very <laughs> much coming out. Oh, and, uh, and there's a feather in the cap, I messed him for the first time. <laughs> yes, this is the news that David yeah. Lowe has resigned. <laughs> Now, how did Laws defend his actions? Well, he said he was um, safeguarding his privacy, um, uh, which I think probably isn't true, technically. Um, he paid £40,000 to um, his partner in accommodation fees. He could have kept their relationship private by not claiming any money from the public. You know, he was a Lib Dem, so, you know, being gay is not a problem. There's a long history of it in the party. <laughs> um, <laughs> But what is a problem is, is basically fiddling your expenses. And um, Nick Clegg promised everything would be cleaner than clean. One of his opening speeches, he said, you tell us what laws you don't like, and it turned out to be David. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and he's had to leave. And it's because the public were sick of all those people fiddling expenses, weren't they, John? Yes, well, David Law said, I hope that people All those will... people had to and... pay back money. Yeah. <laughs> I never did it. That was an insinuation, and I never did it, right? Well, didn't what we... about the council tax that I you paid out? I the council tax, no. On Admiralty Arch? Admiralty Arch, I paid it. Yeah, but you, you paid it back. You, you believe everything in private eye. I think that's yeah, a problem. Yeah, I do. <laughs> We pay for one of your loose seats, though. Was that what in I the would... loose seat? Another story, totally untrue. I have never had the taxpayer pay for my loose seats. <laughs> Just checking. It's, it's two. I bought two loose seats. The taxpayer didn't. Was it for the same loo? Pardon? <laughs> You're a double decker system. <laughs> yeah. It's like kill. Yeah. My trouble is, I admitted to having bulimia, and everybody thought it was connected to the toilet seat. So, we, so the tell... toilet seats, that was... You were quite clean on that one. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't true that the taxpayer paid for those toilet seats. Whatever was said, it was clear. Because some Tory reported me to the parliamentary Ooh, commissioner, bastards. they looked at it admit, <laughs> and admitted it wasn't true. Well, what about do for the me. mock Tudor Bean, then? Well, the same with that. That was inquired into after a complaint by a Tory, and they said there was a replacement of rotten wood, as in other buildings, which was allowed under maintenance. Right. There he goes. So we didn't pay for the loose seat, but we did pay for a lot of other shit you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can put it like that, I think. Anyway, <laughs> David, Law, David Law said, I hope that people will understand that the fear of the loss of privacy rather than the desire for financial gain has been behind the problems I now have. To which one colleague said, reading that made me feel quite weepy. <laughs> Typical Lib Dem. <laughs> Why were the Tories <laughs> upset about him going? <laughs> Why were the Tories... Why were the Tories upset about him going? Um, because they felt he was the perfect man to keep the coalition together, he was more right-wing than a lot of other Lib Dems, and he was going to be the perfect axe man. And sadly, the first thing he axed was himself. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, the Tories felt that Laws was one of us. 
I knew there was something I didn't like about him. <laughs> According to The Guardian, the Conservatives saw what? Laws mm -hmm. as the best intellect in the Lib Dem stable. <laughs> Mind you, it's a bit like saying someone's the hardest man in Islington. Apart from his desire to protect his privacy, yes. how did Laws defend himself paying his partner with taxpayers' money? He said it, it was of no financial benefit to him um, and that he could have been richer if they bought a mortgage together. Well, I'm, gla he... I'm glad um, John's adopting a strong position on that. Mm. I'm using publicly funded buildings for secret love trysts, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say, if the producers are watching, I'm not taking the first punch. <laughs> but he's on my right, not the left. <laughs> but he actually said... <laughs> he actually said they hadn't really been in a marriage. In a statement, Mr Law said, although we were living together, we did not treat each other as spouses. We did not share bank accounts and, indeed, have separate social lives. Certainly sounds like marriage to me. Sorry, Lord. <laughs> My point and entirely. What, <laughs> <laughs> and what would we know about his partner, James Lundy? Isn't he a lobbyist? He is, yes, I believe. I well, gather he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he might even be a Lib Dem. <laughs> well, according to the Telegraph, he's universally rated as the most handsome Liberal Democrat. And according to the journalist Lynn Barber, he's very knowledgeable about sharks. <laughs> And according to Lundy's Twitter feed on the 19th of March, he's falling in love with cheese again. Can't get enough of it. You can for 40 grand, James. <laughs> <laughs> the Sun dealt with this story sensitively. Oh, yes, they asked the readers of The Sun, um, if that's not an oxymoron, that... Um, <laughs> To vote on whether they thought that uh, gay people should be allowed to serve in politics. That's right. Should gay people be cabinet ministers, the question they posed. Typical son. <laughs> Why is it funny that the Lib Dems are now getting into trouble with their expenses? Well, because they were quite holier than now about it. And Laws himself gave out um, election leaflets saying, I've had no trouble with expenses, um, I was first to declare I'm, I'm entirely clean. And also, to be fair, they've never had any expenses up till now. They've never <laughs> done anything. <laughs> they've never had to write letters, they've never had pens, they've never had sticky pads. <laughs> they've never had offices, they just turn up once every few years and go, oh, we're still here, and then go away again, <laughs> on the bus. Laws have been replaced by Danny Alexander. Why did he get that job? I think there's a little aura of ginger about him. And if you look across the cameras, <laughs> that was the ethnic group that's completely missed. Uh, <laughs> I had no idea you were so sophisticated. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as sophisticated as everything else on it. <laughs> well, the Tories want to lib them to be the face of the cuts so that the public don't end up hating George Osborne any more than his face already requires. <laughs> The paper spotted Danny Alexander's uncanny resemblance to somebody this week. He's been nicknamed Beaker after the TV model. <laughs> He's not the only politician to look like a Muppet, though. There's also the Cookie Monster. <laughs> mm. Cookie! <laughs> For an awful moment, I thought you said Nookie, uh, then. <laughs> <laughs> And the other political story this week is the dissolution honours lift. Ian? Oh, right, yes. No, a, a number of very unlikely people have been made peers this week. Um, <laughs> though, obviously, some of them haven't and have renounced it publicly on television. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. Because um, otherwise there'd have been some criticism. Well, of course, the Commons lost... Are, are you going to take it? That's the big story. Well, when they invite me, I'll tell you. OK, and if you take it, will it be because your wife told you to? No, because <laughs> I keep that's reading an insult interviews to my with wife. you. Well, that's the press. I told you it's like private eye. You can't believe everything you read in the papers. But if you read an interview in the Scotsman in which they write down the words that you say to them, and they seem to contain the phrase either "I will never take a peerage" or "My wife told me to," are we to assume you never said anything? Yes, untrue that. Completely yes. untrue. Yes. All of it. And I tell you the trouble with journalists in the main. They get it all on the cuttings. They don't come and ask you. They see a. Were you not interviewed by the Scotsman? 
I don't know whether I was interviewed by the No, you see, that's the trouble with politicians. <laughs> Well, I mean, we never remember anything. No, but we get interviewed by a lot of people and you have to be honest in your reply. I can't remember, but if you ask me, did I say that, I'd say no. No, but do you always remember? Do you remember? believe everything you read in the paper? No, obviously not. Do you believe everything that you say? <laughs> yes, I do. Yes, I do. Well, I mean, that might be unusual, but yes, I do. Of course, the Commons' loss is the Lord's gain. Yes. How will the Commons cope without my debating skills? Just look at what they'll be missing. Gentlemen, has actually put up taxes on the poor in order to put taxes on the middle class. If that's not nothing. all fairness, all I can no, say is you better keep it. Mr. P Mr. P <laughs> Perhaps that's not the behaviour you expect from a lord. But then neither is this. How does this region get out of recession? <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> This is the resignation of David Laws. This story, once again, proves how important it is for an MP to be squeaky clean about their expenses, which is why I, for one, never claimed one penny for my second home, the Hull Meat and Pie Shop. <laughs> so at the end of that round, two points each. Time now for round two. Prescott's Egg of News. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know if you remember, but someone threw an egg at me once. In case you don't, here's a reminder. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the dignity of office. <laughs> well, Tony told me to go out and connect with the electorate, so I did that. <laughs> I'm not looking at that individual. I'd have hit him just for his haircut. <laughs> Prescott's egg of news. An egg will be thrown and will then smash to reveal a new story of the week. Buzz if you know what that story is. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, this is such a lovely story. This is about the pensioner who shaved ten miles off the marathon by taking a sneaky shortcut and ending up in the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> Unfortunately, he got it quite wrong and he actually finished before he actually started. <laughs> yeah, he finished in three hours and five minutes, set in the fastest time ever recorded by anyone over 65. Over a distance of 12 miles. Why, <laughs> <laughs> Why were suspicions first aroused that something fishy had gone on? Because he beat the team from Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> a member of his own athletic club thought the time sounded too good to be true and asked the organisers to investigate. It turned out he'd cut ten miles off the run near Tower Bridge. How exactly did Mr Guskell foul up? Bent down to tie his shoelaces. Got up, couldn't remember where he was. Did he take the tube? <laughs> In fact, each runner has a microchip. I didn't know this. Yeah. which tracked their progress, according to the Telegraph. Gaskell's chip said he completed the first 12 and a half miles in just over two hours. Then there was a gap in the chip readings before he crossed the 25 mile mark at about 41 <laughs> minutes later. <laughs> a time not even the world record holder could match. He just jumped. <laughs> <laughs> but in other sporting controversies, why have the Middlesbrough and Tranmere ladies football team been bothering the courts this week? It, it's not because one of them was actually a man. No. no. In the umpire, what do they have in basketball? Uh, referees, I suppose. Yeah, I thought you said, did you say football, football. or basketball? In football. Oh, football. Oh, football. Oh, right, yeah. I believe it's a referee, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm indebted to you, my lady friend. <laughs> <laughs> well, a jury cleared a lady footballer who punched her rival, oh. broke her cheekbone after a 22 player post match brawl. I love that idea of a 22 woman brawl <laughs> in mud. You know what I mean? Now that's going to make women's football a lot more popular. <laughs> but what would you say in clientele? So, John, what would you I do if it came up against information, <laughs> John? <laughs> I just imagine the. Oh, oh this is all right. Outside, <laughs> outside the mud scene, John, what would you have done if you'd come up against this lady? She's a notorious American soccer player. Oh, yeah, yeah. Is a nickname Chopper. <laughs> oh. 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 <laughs> that is just me. 
I used to do that to my sister. <laughs> <laughs> and the England World Cup squad has left for South Africa. Who got left behind? The big news is young Theo wasn't allowed into the squad. I was gutted. <laughs> gutted! <laughs> Left out Theo. <laughs> what is Fabio playing at? <laughs> this is pensioner Anti Gaskell, who's been accused of cheating in the London Marathon. He was officially recorded as the fastest pensioner, but according to the Daily Mail, he's now been stripped of his title. Strip a man of his title? Is that possible? <laughs> Mr Gaskell's shortcut was found out because each runner is given a chip. Make it a bag and throw in a few scraps and I'll run the damn race. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gaskell's finishing time was three hours and five minutes. Coincidentally, it's the same length of time in a good less message that I received from Lord Kinnock on the, on the last phone last yeah. night. Gonna be doing that. <laughs> I didn't know that yet. <laughs> Quite mean to be doing a joke about Lord Kinnock being a gassy windbag and you can't get it out. <laughs> Fingers on the buzzer, teams. A man with the worst shirt ever. <laughs> this is the Japanese Prime Minister who's causing a bit of a scandal in his country because of this shirt. Many different colours. It's uh, belonged to Joseph before him. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> other people in Japan are now seeing this as a great fashion item. Yes, this is the... <laughs> <laughs> I just did it as a joke. Yeah. <laughs> well, so did he, clearly. <laughs> Yes, this is the news that the Japanese Prime Minister has been ridiculed for his fashion sense after wearing this particular shirt. What has the fashion world likened it to? An explosion in a gingham factory? <laughs> a ridiculous coalition of different colours? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like an eye test. It looks like one of those psychological tests. If you look at it and go, can you see a dog in there? <laughs> they likened it to a Rubik's Cube. The Prime Minister's a long history of fashion crimes. Oh, no. right. mm. Early Elvis. <laughs> Early Lionel Blair. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Noel Edmonds. <laughs> Lovely. Any comments here, Paul? No, I just have you get I think you bottled one. that one, didn't you? Yeah. I really like that blouse. <laughs> I think it's really pretty. <laughs> I tell you what, it feels lovely. Oh. And the shirt does too. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a sexual shang... harassment in the workplace. <laughs> <laughs> a Shanghai based shirt maker has made a limited edition replica of the Rubik's Cube, a shirt costing £347. Who is the shirt aimed at? Obviously, not aimed at epileptic people, because if he ran, they'd all have a fit. <laughs> Well, according to the makers, we think it will be for people who support individuality and creativity. We're also encouraging other leading politicians to wear the shirt as a show of support for the Prime Minister. Mine's a medium. <laughs> Closer to home, Ian. Who yes. else has been picked up on their fashion sense this week? Why did you say Ian in that way? Because I'm known for my fashion sense. <laughs> I am the Gok Kwan. <laughs> Well, actually, it's Theresa May. Oh. According to the Mail, she's worn this jacket for every key event of the last fortnight. Expenses aren't <laughs> what they used to be. <laughs> it looks as though it needs the helmet. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. so this she's is been the... wearing it that long, she's got a parking meter on it. Look at her now. <laughs> by the mail of attending meetings of the new cabinet wearing a Thunderbirds jacket, though unlike Thunderbirds, there's no brains. <laughs> Fingers on the buzzer, teams. <laughs> ah, yes, this is the anniversary of the driving test. Um, 80 years ago, something like that. Um, in Ireland in the 1970s, such was the backlog of people who had applied for driving licences that uh, they couldn't get a test for two or three years. So the Irish government said, well, if you have a provisional driving licence, you've passed. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, what, I'm at 75 years old. Can you guess the headline? It's a uh, hell of an anniversary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't boo me, I've been asked what the papers are saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a professional comic, I don't go around it's doing true, jokes like that. It's true, it was that. even so at the time. It's a laugh, of course. <laughs> Is this one on? hell of a birthday. Oh, one hell of a birthday, I was right. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. 
And I'd like to see us return to a black and white world. Yeah. <laughs> well, what are you clapping that for? It's an idiotic thing to say. <laughs> but I like this as well. I like the fact that they've got the first registered photograph of dogging ever to take place. <laughs> Who remembers Maureen? Maureen? So, I've read your CV, John, but it's just <laughs> not. <laughs> um, I think that took the driving test the most times ever, wasn't she? And then she went and got her own reality TV show where she essentially just went around bumping into things a bit like a Dodge <laughs> car. One of those reality TV shows that should have been called There Is Someone Thicker Than You. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ben is absolutely right. She's more in from the reality TV show Driving School, mm. who eventually passed her test after eight attempts. Here she is in action. I told you to slow down. No, no, no. a little bit staged to me. Are you saying reality shows are faked? <laughs> I say you filmed an awful lot of her driving before you got an incident like that so close <laughs> in the camera. Imagine filming loads of stuff just so you can get half an hour's programme out of it. <laughs> it really depends who's driving. <laughs> <laughs> On the subject of transport, anyone want to see the unusual way one child decided to go up an escalator? Yes. Oh, yeah. Right, let's have a see of it. This is incredible. You have to watch the bloke on the on the ground actually as he's coming up. We did this on GMTV. There he is, running round. Look. And jump, then he bounces him twice, kicks him upstream, he's a rugby player. <laughs> Caught. <laughs> oh my god. I thought Michael Jackson was dead. <laughs> Who, who's the guy who caught him? Just a random passerby who'd noticed him going off on the... Do the social services know he's fiddling with kids? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the film's reversed. He threw the kid up there. <laughs> <laughs> Which means at the end of this round, it's Ian and John with two, <laughs> Paul and Penny, five. Wait. Five. That's you. You've got your Time now for the Missing Words Round. Oh, good. Which this week features as its guest publication the British Beer Mat Collector's Society newsletter. <laughs> and we start with, I've got what and I'm going home to what? I've got a cabinet post and I'm going home to my mate. <laughs> I've got caught out and I'm going home to face the missus. <laughs> the answer is... But luckily, I'm going to become a lord. And I'm going... <laughs> Can we do that again? Because the twit at the end there. <laughs> <laughs> you want to do it again? Yeah, do it again. Yeah, yeah let's do it again. OK, so I've got what and I'm going home to what? I've got caught and I'm going home to the missus. <laughs> John, any advance on that? No, that's not fair, cos mine was funny before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, do it again. I've got a cabinet post and I'm going home to my good mate. <laughs> well, the answer is my iPad and I'm going home to stroke it. <laughs> this is Stephen Fry, who was overjoyed at the launch of the new iPad this week. According to The Times, the iPad is now selling at a rate of one million a month. Shops haven't seen anything like this since the launch of my autobiography. <laughs> Still available in all good pound shops. <laughs> Next, what by rubbing moist bread over the affected areas? Attract Randy Seagulls. <laughs> is it become a peer right. of the realm? <laughs> If your beer mat collection has been somewhat sporked by beer, it's relatively easy to remove the stain from the cardboard by rubbing moist bread over the affected areas. <laughs> the answer is clean, slightly beer-stained oh. mats. Yes! Yeah. Nice. 
<laughs> Next. Man stuck in vending machine, what? Is it dispenses himself in very small packages? <laughs> I was say, wins Turner Prize. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is, after reaching inside for a toy. This was at a pub near Ipswich. According to the mirror, the man was treated for shock. I was treated for shock once in a London pub. Five quid for a bloody pint. <laughs> <laughs> Next. The Beer Mac Collector Society meetings usually include raffles and a quiz, but what? But tonight we were treated to an orgy of sex. <laughs> Between Eamon Holmes, a yak, and the Archbishop of Canterbury. <laughs> the answer is... If that's right, I'll give everybody a pound. Emphasis <laughs> all, the emphasis is always on beer or beer mats. Ah. <laughs> and lastly, Prime Minister, let's slip. He's what? He's a conservative. <laughs> He's gay too. <laughs> the answer is, had the snip. This is the Prime Minister of New Zealand, who told me for. No, I'm not off. I'm gone for that. <laughs> we won't want a bit of bollocks. <laughs> this is the Prime Minister of New Zealand who told reporters he had a vasectomy. My <laughs> Vasectomy? <laughs> you won't know... You will not know how long this afternoon I've been trying to do that work. <laughs> I can tell you, and then the Prime Minister's questions, I had difficulties with other words. I made a reputation out of it. I tried to say the name Milosevic, and I thought, and I, the Prime Minister asked the question, so I said, Milosevic. <laughs> I thought, if you say it quickly, nobody will pick it up. <laughs> Big mistake. It's amazing, isn't it? Just written, it's written phonetically as well. I know. <laughs> and that's why I've been trying to do it. It's true. It is. And you know what? You should have stood your ground and just said the snip. You don't have to say susceptible. They said that, but I thought the word to say the word properly if I could, and I didn't. But that's <laughs> life. <laughs> that's a Jewish mate. Yeah. Mind you, it's not only the word. Uh, go back again then, I'll put snip in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on, you're being mean. <laughs> It's a pretty small mistake in the light of the last 15 years. Go <laughs> on, John, give it a go. Take a deep breath. Oh, well, OK, then. Think of being okay. handed a very, very delicate okay. vase, piece of porcelain, and, you know, in a, in a sort of vase. Eck to me. There we are. <laughs> don't start me. I don't think you've got it. Eck to me. Vase, eck to me. Look, I'm no, on trial. Let like me go, let me go. OK, right. go and go. At least the are you doing the first bit first, right? Let's do the first part okay. first, second part second. Well, I've got the... <laughs> Word at once. <laughs> Bloody hell. Do I read that out? Yeah, read that out. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to, God's sake, give him some. <laughs> this is the Prime Minister of New Zealand who told the reporters he'd had a snip. <laughs> Confusing. This could be confusing. If you went to the barbers and he says, do you fancy a snip behind the ear? <laughs> You're in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> so the final scores are... Ian and John, two. <laughs> Paul and Penny, six. <laughs> I don't know these scores are made up. I don't believe that. But before we go, there's just time for the caption competition. Paul and Penny have this. Do you know, what is this thing about keeping your balls up? I mean, what, what is the... Po is it difficult? What do do we care? It's considered an inherent part of the game to be able to control the ball. <laughs> but if I'm not much mistaken, David Cameron is not a footballer, unless Well, I'm the mistaken. ball may be suspended by a piece of wire, we really don't know. But we can see... <laughs> There he is appearing with Britain's leading crisp salesman. And I <laughs> Ian and John get that. Capello finally finds someone who's good in a box. 
On which note, we say thank you to our panellists, Ian Hislop and John Bishop, Paul Merton and Penny Smith, and I leave you with the news that after new expense regulations are brought in, Hazel Blair's reluctantly agreed to get rid of her second home. <laughs> It's another meeting in the Cabinet Office, and the usual volunteer offers to go and get the coffees. <laughs> uh, there are cheers all round, as another Lib Dem MP emerges from David Cameron's brainwashing chamber. <laughs> and in central London, some good news at last. There's a parking space right outside Greg's, the Baker's. <laughs> Good night. Over on BBC One Wales now, Jeff Green and Patrick Keelty hit the boards for Michael McIntyre's Comedy Roadshow. Here on BBC Two Wales, who's the best? I'm in a rock band, a rock and roll band. The live event is next. Or there's more comedy from Family Guy over on BBC Three. There are certain sort of uh, okay. composers' names that suit certain sort of acts, certain accents and stuff, and. Uh... A Liverpudlian accent I'm very fond of. I hope John will forgive me for this, but uh, the composer that best suits a Liverpudlian accent, without a doubt, is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart! <laughs> <laughs> Cardiff is Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> Birmingham, the Midlands, is Rimsky Korsikov. <laughs> oh, there was an Irish one. Beethoven. <laughs> Beethoven. 